The psalmist says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. We begin this morning by singing a hymn uh, from our blue books, hymn number 161. Now thank we all our God, a hymn of praise for all that God has done so graciously for us. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning with thankful hearts for all that you have done. 
as we gather together as your people, that is testimony to your great grace at work amongst us. We ask that you would give us a growing knowledge of your love for us, that we would be increasingly gripped by it, and so that you would turn us to praise you. We praise you for the wonders you have done throughout history. We thank you for the countless gifts of love that you have poured out on us, your people, here in Glasgow. It is a great delight to praise you as we think on everything you have done through your Son in his life, death, and resurrection. An act so great, so loving, and so significant that all the world should praise you for it. We pray that you would fill our hearts with joy to overflowing, that the world would see in us something of your great grace and generosity. Heavenly Father, we know that without your grace and kindness, we would be without hope. So we pray this morning that you would keep us in your fold. Forgive us for how easily we stray, for how easily we forget what you have done. Forgive us for when we would trample on your goodness. So we pray that you would keep us in your fold and that you would keep us rejoicing in all that you have done. We pray that when thankfulness and praise are far from our hearts, that you would remind us afresh of your great love and actions for us. We thank that you are God of highest heaven, sovereign over all the earth and each of our lives. We thank you that through your Son and Spirit, we are now partakers of the most profound mystery in the world, that we would be joined to Jesus, reconciled to you, that we might call you our Father. Lord, we know that you are worthy of all adoration, so teach us that we might adore you. Use us to spread your name throughout the world, that people from every tribe and tongue and nation might see your glory and praise you as they ought. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and are doing in the world. We thank you that, you, that we are a part of that. So we ask that you please be with us this morning as we continue to worship you. For we pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. A very warm welcome to everyone this morning. If you're visiting with us, then we hope you will feel particularly welcome and that we'll have the chance to meet you after the service. If you're new and are planning to come along regularly, we'd also love to meet you. And please do uh, find one of us and uh, discover what we've uh, got here at church that you might be able to fit in with. You'll also find plenty of information in these notice sheets, uh, which we turn to now. Just to highlight one thing uh, in particular, tonight's evening service is going to be held uh, not here, but at the Tron Church at Kelvin Grove. This will be a service of baptism and admission to membership. I'm sure it will be a great encouragement to us all, so please do make every effort to be there for our service at 6.30. If you'd struggle to get there by yourself, uh, then leaving here at 6 o'clock there will be lifts, so please do make use of that if it would be helpful. But moving on from that now, let's turn to our Bible readings. We pick up from where we left off in Nehemiah. We'll be reading from the very end of chapter 9 through to the end of chapter 10. If you're using a church visitor's Bible, uh, that is on page 406. Last week we read the people's prayer in chapter 9, and this week it's the people's response along with that prayer. So beginning chapter 9, verse 38, reading through to the end of chapter 10. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. On the seals are the names of Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pashur, Amariah, Malkijah, Hattush, Shebaniah, Maluk, Harim, Meramoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Baruch, Meshulam, Abijah, Mejamin, Maziah, Bilgai, Shemaiah, 
These are the priests and the Levites, Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Binui of the sons of Henadad, Kadmiel and their brothers, Shabaniah, Hodiah, Kalita, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Shabaniah, Hodiah, Bani, Benuni, the chiefs of the people, Parosh, Pahath, Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Buni, Asgad, Bebai, Adonijah, Bigvai, Adin, Ater, Hezekiah, Azur, Hodiah, Hashem, Bezai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpaesh, Meshulam, Hezer, Mishazabel, Zadok, Jadua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Hananiah, Hoshea, Hananiah, Hashub, Halahesh, Pilha, Shubek, Rehum, Hashabna, Masea, Ahaya, Hanan, Anan, Maluk, Harim, Bana. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the people of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We will also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the shoe bread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people, have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God, according to our Father's houses at times appointed, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of your ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord, also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe to the tithes, the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Amen. Now we turn to sing a hymn in the blue books again. A great prayer for any church, but especially as we're on the cusp of spreading out into a new area of minister, ministry and as the church life will take a bit of a change. Hymn number 541. O breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. O breath of life, come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this hour.
we now have a few moments of quiet whilst the offering is taken up. You might want to turn and read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. It will be helpful for what Willie is going to be teaching us this morning. Or maybe you could be in prayer quietly for someone you know who's struggling whilst the offering is taken up. Just before we pray, let me congratulate uh, Jordan and Nicola Black on the birth of little Benjamin last night, at long last. Uh, congratulations to them and all the Black family. And also congratulations to Mo Oroko, who finally got his act together and has got engaged to Amy Boardman. So, didn't have to have me chiving him along. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your bountiful good gifts that you give to us, not least of love, of family, of children, of friends, of the joy of fellowship that we enjoy together, brought together as we are here in this building this morning from so many different nations, different places, different backgrounds, but all made one through Jesus Christ, your Son. Nowhere else in the world is there such evidence of unifying power, of the reality of what your grace alone can do, bringing sinful, rebellious human beings together because they're brought together in you. But we thank you, Lord, that this is your plan and your purpose for this whole world. That one day, earth and heaven itself will be united again forever. That all the heavenly host will see the wonder, the glory, the majesty and the wisdom of our God. Through what you have done in saving the church of Jesus Christ, your son. So Lord, keep this great joy and gladness before us, we pray as our continual hope, how much we need that hope burning brightly in our hearts as we look at the world around and see so much darkness, so much sadness and sorrow, so much suffering, and so much of it all coming from the wickedness that emanates from the human heart, the world torn apart by conflict in so many places. So many disasters that we call natural disasters, yet not natural at all, but side effects from the rapacious greed so often at work in the human race. Lord, you have opened our eyes to the light of your glorious gospel, to the wonder of your eternal kingdom. And yet, 
so easily even our own hearts are drawn back, back to the things of this mere passing world. Forgive us, Lord, we pray, and turn our eyes and the eyes of our hearts afresh to you. That we might walk every day of our lives here on our pilgrimage, our exile on this earth, but looking towards the glory that is dawning even now from Emmanuel's land. Help us to be a people called out, distinct, holy, to shine forth the light of our Father in heaven, that this world might see in this, your church, the pillar and the buttress of truth, might see goodness, that which is right and true and holy and beautiful and desirable and joyful, and long for you, who is the author of all of these things. Lord, we commit ourselves as a church to you at this time of change and transition. What joy we have today as we welcome so many new members to our fellowship. May tonight's service, we ask, be a time of gladness and great rejoicing. And may our confidence in the power of your gospel be strengthened. We might know just how powerful you are. And may that spur us as we begin our new meeting on the south side of the city next Sunday afternoon at Tron at Queen's Park. That we should look to you, Lord, with expectancy, with joy, with thanksgiving, longing that you would work through us to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to more people, that many might continue to join with us in praising your name, having been changed forever through the gospel of your Son. Lord, we are weak and fearful. We have so many lacks. We look to you for everything. We know that without you we can do nothing. So help us, we pray, in all our feeble efforts. Give us strength. Give us hope. Give us contentment in the mere passing things of this world. And give us an eager appetite all the more for that which will last forever, the joys of your kingdom, that we might see it grow and advance here in our city and that nothing might be more joyful to our hearts than to see Christ Jesus being placarded before the citizens of this city, and his name being honored, his word being obeyed, and his praise on the lips of more and more people in this city. So, Lord, come to us, we pray, as we come to your word this morning, seeking you and asking that you would reveal yourself to us. Humble us, we ask. Open our hearts. Enable us to hear your words of encouragement, of instruction, but yes, of challenge and also rebuke, that you might take us and hone us and shape us in the image of your Son, one who, though he was rich beyond all splendor, yet for love's sake became so poor that we might be raised to share your everlasting glory. May his spirit inhabit ours, we pray, and drive all that we think and say and do. For we ask it for the glory of Christ and in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing before we come to God's word, number 366, Lord, you were rich beyond all splendor, yet for love's sake became poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved courts for a stable floor. 366.
Well, do turn with me, if you would, to um, Nehemiah chapter 10, page 406, if you have one of our uh, visitors' Bibles. A chapter all about the obedience of real faith. What does real Christian faith look like in a person who's a true Christian or in a church that is a truly Christian church? Well, faith has become a very threadbare term in our culture today. It usually just means uh, a vague belief in something, um, or even worse, a belief in something against all the evidence against it being true. I still believe that Scotland has a very fine football team. But let me say very clearly that this kind of idea of faith, which is little more than wishful thinking and even fantasy, it is the very opposite of what the Bible actually means by faith. Faith, as the Bible speaks of it, is never a leap into the dark. Faith is a step into the light. It is eyes being opened to see the ultimate reality, at last the glory of God and his eternal purposes. And it's hearts being opened to uh, all of that reality through an experience of real repentance, which is a turning of our allegiance away from sin and towards uh, the living God, away from the idolatry of this world, and towards obedient submission to God in Jesus Christ. And that real repentance, which lies at the very heart of all real biblical faith, it is always a visible and a tangible thing. So what does it look like? Well, here is a chapter that I think demonstrates very clearly what the fruit of real heart repentance and renewed faith looks like uh, in a congregation of God's people, a people who have truly received God's word and where that word is bearing fruit in their midst. And as Paul says, remember, all of these scriptures of the Old Testament, they're all written down for our instruction, even though we live in these ends of the ages, they're here to teach us. And how much more should we today, who have received so much more, how much more should we be challenged and encouraged by this example of real living faith that's deeply personal, that's public, that's so deliberate and purposeful in its determination to honor the commands of God in every part of life, to glorify him before the whole world as children of light, showing forth everything that is good and right and true to the peoples of the lands around So look at how this chapter demonstrates that real faith and how that living faith manifests in obedience that is a very solid and tangible thing, in real commitment, in real consecration, and with real cost. Look at chapter 9, verse 38, through to chapter 10, verse 27, this great long list of names. The meaningful seals that uh, this speaks about tells us of the commitment of real signatories. The commitment of real signatories. Verse 38, because of all this, that's their confession of sin, their recommitment to God as their, uh, as their God, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. And on the sealed document are the names, the names of all the leaders, uh, all the people. From the governor, the priests, the Levites, uh, to all the rest. Now, the great prayer that we looked at last week in chapter 9 made very clear that the people's only hope was in the Lord God's forgiving and restoring grace. If you look back to chapter 9, verse 31, you'll see it's very clear. Israel, the only reason Israel was not forsaken, not destroyed, was because of God's grace and mercy. Because, as verse 32 there says, because God keeps covenant and steadfast love. But God's grace, God's covenant grace, is never cheap grace. God's grace always demands response from his people. And the response that God requires is faithful repentance. Or repentant faith, whichever way you like to put it, because it's all the same thing. It's about a real unreserved surrender to the rule of the one true God. And that's always so, right through the Bible from beginning to end. You come to Romans chapter 10, Paul says so clearly that his gospel that he's preaching is one and the same covenant faith that Moses preached. 
And he calls people, just as Moses did, to trust and obey. Paul says, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that is, trust in his death and resurrection to be your Savior, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is, submit to his rule and to obey him as Lord and Master. Do these things, and you will be saved. Trust and obey. And notice what this confession of lordship really means. It's a necessarily public thing, isn't it, for Paul? You commit yourself with your lips that your life is to be lived in obedience to Christ's rule as a binding commitment made publicly before God and in front of other people who are there to hold you to it. And that's exactly what we see here in our chapter this morning. It's purposeful, it's deliberate, it's in writing, it's public as well as personal. Every name is there together in a commitment of the whole congregation of Israel to one another and to God himself. And of course that's echoed in the New Testament in just the same way. Where there's never any conception that you can be a Christian, a real follower of Jesus and not be at the same time a committed member of the living church of Jesus Christ. Because belonging to Jesus means that you belong to his people. Loving Jesus means that you love his people. Being committed properly to Jesus means you're committed properly to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you make public commitment to the church through baptism as, as whole households become publicly committed Christian households in the New Testament. Just like here in verse 28, it's exactly the same. Children along with parents and so on. And that's why tonight when we'll, be, uh, uh, when we'll be welcoming new members into our fellowship, they'll be doing exactly that, won't they? Making public confession of their faith and a personal commitment to serve Christ with us in this church here. Covenanting together to live under the rule of one master, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to keep one another to that. And that's the pattern that God has laid out for his church. The church is not just a collection of individual Christians. It's a body, says the Apostle Paul, with many members, each vitally connected to each other. And we need that, don't we? We live in an age when people are increasingly reticent and fearful often of commitment. They want to shrink back often even from commitment to the church. But that's not just an insult to Christ because what you're saying is you don't really trust his pattern that he wants for his church. But also it's very foolish, it's very dangerous because we need one another. None of us is ever beyond the danger of slipping away, of falling back in our faith. That's why the New Testament urges us constantly not to give up meeting together, not to give up praying together, learning together being challenged together, keeping one another in the faith. That's what we're called to do. If we don't do that, it's a disaster. Now, some of us are probably very aware of very particular struggles that we might have, particular temptations that we're very vulnerable to. And people like that do tend to make very sure that they're surrounded by the body of Christ to keep them accountable. But as somebody has said, it's not only obvious moral crashes that betoken a falling away from God. There's the dullness of spirit that's never marked in such a way. There's a lack of care and concern for the things of God. There's the slow, imperceptible coldness of heart that reduces spiritual life to a chilling and tragic mediocrity. And how many ways believers can be betrayed into unfaithfulness over the years, I've certainly seen many, many more drift away into coldness and mediocrity than I have seen collapse through some great moral calamity in their life. And that's why Christ calls us to that binding commitment, both public and personal, in covenant union with him and with one another in his church, and to the regular covenant renewals that we need week by week as we meet together to recommit ourselves to bind ourselves again to the Lordship of Jesus Christ together under his rule. This is the means of grace that enables us to endure, to keep faith with God. We can't presume upon God, can we? We will only persevere if we make use of the means that God has given us and commanded us to use so that we will persevere. And that is the church. 
Paul's so clear on that in Ephesians 4, isn't he? We will only attain the maturity and the completeness, which is the goal of our faith, he says, as part of the body of Christ. The whole body, when each part is working properly, builds itself in love as it draws on Christ, who's the head. So, friend, heeds the Bible's warning. If you remain on the fringe, if you remain never personally committed, never publicly committed to the church of Jesus Christ, never belonging in that committed way with others in a real and living church fellowship, that's not just disobedient to Christ. It's deadly dangerous for you. The meaningful seals here reflect the commitment of real signatories, a people personally and publicly committed in covenant with God and with one another to be his people, to live as his people, to live in obedience to his call upon them, which is what being a believer is all about. But what is that commitment to? Well, verses 28 to 31 tell us. It means commitment to a meaningful separation. These verses describe a consecration of real seriousness. First notice just how deadly serious it is. Verse 29, together they enter into a curse and an oath. That is a very solemn covenant vow, calling on God to judge them if they should go back on their word. Now again, we live in a very superficial age where words and pledges just don't mean much. But there is nothing flippant here, is there? Nothing frivolous. These people took the living God very seriously indeed. And I think as Christians today, perhaps, we need to learn to take the living God a little more seriously than we do most of the time. I think sometimes we read the Old Testament, don't we? And we think, well, yes, but it's all different for us now, isn't it? <coughs> Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He would never make us tremble. He would never talk about curses and judgments. <laughs> Friends, if that's what you think, it must be a long time since you've been reading the Gospels. Go back and read them. Almost every page is full of Jesus' own urgent warnings. Read the epistles. It is a fearful thing, says Hebrews 10, to fall into the hands of the living God if you renege on your vow to follow Christ and thereby profane the blood of the covenant by which you're sanctified, by which you've been separated, set apart to be holy to the Lord. No, let us serve God with reverence and awe, says the apostle, to the Christian church, he's speaking. As these people here were certainly doing. They covenanted themselves together with real seriousness. And they understood that they meant what they said. That they should be consecrated, that they should be set apart, separated Verse 28, separated from the peoples of the lands. Note that phrase again in verse 30 and verse 31. And separated to the law of the Lord, their God. At the heart of what it means to be God's redeemed people lies a great separation. Not a racial separation, of course. All through the Bible story, there were Gentile outsiders who were brought in and became holy along with the people of God. But this is a religious separation from all false gods, from all false religions, from all uh, pagan attitudes and cultures to a living walk with the true and living God. That's the heart of the covenant. Listen to these words from Leviticus chapter 26. I will walk among you and will be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the, bar, uh, I've broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. What a magnificent description of redemption. You've been redeemed from bondage, from the world of pagan idolatry, but to the life of the one true God, and therefore set apart to be his distinct and his distinctive people. Shaped in every way by his commands. Verse 29, by his rules, by his statutes. So as to display in this dark world, in this fallen world, the brightness, the beauty, the grace of God, the health, the wholeness of true humanity that is being restored into his image through grace. 
And that must entail, mustn't it, a great separation from the culture, from the values, from the morality, from the ambitions of a world that doesn't know God and that hates God and is opposed to God. At the heart of God's covenant grace lies a great necessary negative. Leviticus 20. You shall not walk in the customs of the nations I am driving out before you. For they did all of these things. And he's talking about vile sexual practices, child sacrifice, terrible violence, exploitation. They did these things and therefore I detested them. But I am the Lord who has separated you from the peoples. You shall be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from these peoples that you should be mine. But of course, repeatedly in their sinfulness, they had not separated themselves. And they just acted exactly like the pagan world around them. And so eventually God had cast them out of the land into exile. If you look back at chapter 9, verse 30, you look at the language. It says God gave them back into the hand of the peoples of the lands. But now he has fulfilled again the promise that he gave through the prophets of another great redemption to bring them out, just like out of Egypt, out of exile, and once again to be separated as his true people. Listen to the words of the prophet. Shake yourself from the dust and arise, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. You shall be redeemed. The watchmen see the return of the Lord to Zion. The ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her, from amidst of the people of the lands. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. That was what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 51. And here's the beginning of that fulfillment. As the returned exiles consecrate themselves to be a people, again, set apart to the Lord their God. A people called out of darkness and into light. A people called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called them out of darkness into light and to show forth his beauty again in the world. And of course, if that kind of language sounds very familiar to us from the New Testament, it should do because it's the Apostle Peter's description, isn't it, of the Christian church. And that is because the ultimate fulfillment of all these prophetic promises to restore God's people, to make them truly holy, it only comes to its fulfillment in the person and work of our Lord Jesus, in the great redemption that separates God's people forever from the world of sin, from the flesh, from the devil. And brings us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Paul says to the Romans, you have been separated from death to life. From being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness. To being obedient from the heart to the teaching about Christ that they'd received. So we're to no longer live like the world, but as children of God in Christ. That's what the apostle says. Or Peter in 1 Peter 1, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the patterns and the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He's quoting Leviticus. Just as Paul does when he quotes both Leviticus 26 and Isaiah 51 that I just quoted there. Quotes that to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where he urges and commands them to be separate from the culture of unbelief that is all around them. For what partnership does unrighteousness have with righteousness? Or what fellowship light with darkness? What agreement does the temple of the Lord have with idols, says Paul? For we are the temple of the living God. God said, I will make my dwelling among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, be separate from them, says the Lord. That's Paul writing to the Christian church. So he says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. That's exactly the same spirit, isn't it, as these verses in front of us. But how much more so for us 
who are being redeemed not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be holy in all your conduct, says Peter. Conduct yourselves with reverent fear all the time of your exile here on earth as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus. See, friends, the call to Christian faith is the call to deadly serious consecration, to separation, to set apartness from the ways of this world, from the peoples of the lands who don't know God and who are naturally opposed to God and defiant for the Lord our Master. There's a great necessary negative at the very heart of the Christian faith. And it's there all the way through the Bible from beginning to end. The Lord Jesus put it very distinctly, didn't he? If anyone would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and come and follow me. Follow me on a road that the world despises. We need to take that seriously, don't we? Because today there's a great desire, understandably, to make the Christian message a positive message. And of course it is the most positive good news that this world could ever, ever hear. But the gospel is also a message of bad news, isn't it? It's bad news for sin. It's bad news for sinful desires. It's bad news for, th sin for sinful thinking. Bad news for sinful actions. Because it demands an end. It demands that we abandon all of that forever to follow Jesus. We take our orders no longer from the world, but from the word of God. If you are my friend, says Jesus, you'll do what I command you. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, not the world's word. And that will always put us at odds with the way of this world, the peoples of the lands right about us. Look at the two things singled out here in verses 30 and 31. It's obviously contemporary issues for Nehemiah's time. There are also things that are singled out in the New Testament and are just as contemporary today. It's God's people's attitudes which are to be radically different from the world in matters of marriage and in material matters. Verse 30 speaks about a separation to exclusively holy sexual relationships. Not with the peoples of the land or indeed not like the peoples of the lands. Now again, the reason is not racial, but it's religious. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and many other places make it very plain. Don't go that way, says the Lord, or these partnerships will take you away from the Lord your God. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in that passage I quoted from in 2 Corinthians. He goes on to say, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers in this area of life or in any area of life. It is the road to certain ruin. Now, you don't believe that, some of you, so let me say it again. It is the road to certain ruin of your faith according to the Word of God. Now, Christian believers, we're different. We know that marriage and sexual relationships, and by the way, marriage and sexual relationships are, two, are, are one and the same thing in the Bible. It's the same way of talking about the same thing. A sexual relationship is a marriage relationship. A marriage relationship is a sexual relationship. Nothing else. But we know that that is a gift that God gives us for the service of his kingdom. Genesis 2 alone makes that absolutely plain. It's given to glorify God in his way, in his purposes. So we're never to think about these things as the world does, perversely or just selfishly. We've made the God Eros, the God of our modern Western culture today, haven't we? It's worshipped everywhere, constantly. And how utterly confused, how utterly corrupted our world has become in this area. In fact, increasingly absurdly so. We've now got the situation where the feminist gurus of the 60s and 70s, Jermaine Greer and these others who wanted to obliterate all gender distinctions completely, they're now at loggerheads with today's advocates of gender fluidity who want to uh, exalt gender differentiation as the most important thing in the world. So important that even your mind's perception of gender can be so real that you have to mutilate your body to bring it into line with the latest idea of your mind. How extraordinary 
that is. God, help us. What a terrible time bomb we're storing up for the future of our children. We, we always hear these days, don't we, about mis-selling scandals. Friends, this is going to be the biggest mis-selling scandal of them all in 20, 30 years' time. Such vulnerable people, such needy people, young kids who are so easily led, so easily misled. That's what happens when we follow the world's thinking about sexuality and not God's. But no, God's people are not to think as the world does. Because we have a far better, a far healthier, a far more joyful, a more satisfying understanding of these God-ordained relationships for human beings. And we must be set apart for that. As Hebrews 13 says, let marriage be held in honor by all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterer. And then the very next verse goes on to say this, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have for I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, isn't it striking that the next verse here also goes on to talk exactly about material matters. Because God's people are not to have the world's attitude to sexual gratification or the world's attitude to material gratification. And the Sabbath principle in the Bible is all about our attitude to material things. There's a whole raft of teaching about the Sabbath patterns that are to, to permeate the whole of the life of the people of God. But you can see it even just in the two things that are mentioned here, the Sabbath day every week and the Sabbath year every seventh year. You can read about those in uh, Leviticus 25 and uh, Deuteronomy 15 and, and other places. But every seventh year, you are not to work your land. You and the land both were to have a sabbatical. And God said, leave the produce of the land for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the fatherless. There'll be enough also for you to eat but just not enough to turn a handsome profit that year. And every debt you'll forgive in that year, every indentured slave or laborer who's yours, you let them go free. What is that law telling us? It's telling us that for God's people, there is far, far more to life than just material gain. God's people are not to live as slaves to material things. We're not to be greed-driven. Uh, driven. We're not to be gain-driven. We're to be grace-driven people. We're to be full of gratitude for everything that God provides. And we're to trust God that he will provide what we need. We're not to be anxiously, constantly toiling for all the things we think we need, all the things we want, the things we're determined to have, even if it means great exploitation of others. That's the world's way, isn't it? Verse 31, the peoples of the land slave at their work seven days a week, relentlessly buying and selling year in, year out. But God's people get a holiday, a holy day every single week and sabbaticals every seventh year because there are far more important things for God's people than worldly gain. I find it so strange when Christians seem to have a terrible bee in their bonnet about not being legalistic about the Sabbath day. I don't want to be in bondage to a Sabbath day. I mean, that's like saying, I don't want to be in bondage to holidays. I'm not going to have holidays. I'm not going to have that terrible burden. It's so legalistic. No, I'm going to work every single day of the year. How many people do you know who say that? Let's go back to the bondage of Egypt said the Israelites. We didn't have to have Sabbath days there. We could work every single day. We could work ourselves to an early grave. Let's go. It's great back in Egypt. <laughs> it's free people, says the Lord, who get Sabbath. Isn't the human heart so absolutely perverse? But you see, we are, aren't we? We're so easily blinded by material things. And we need to ask if there is really an obvious separation a separateness about our lives uh, as believers. A difference from the world around in this whole area of striving after material gain. Chasing it as though it really were all there was in life. And forgetting about the one who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. To give us all that we need. All the peoples of the world slave after things. 
says Jesus in Luke chapter 12. And your father knows that you need them, but instead seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. It's in vain, says the psalmist, that you eat the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. And he gives his beloved Sabbath, joy, liberation throughout our lives, not to slave mercilessly for the material, to be content with what we have because we have him and he'll never leave us or forsake us. But if that's so, then surely there will be some visible and tangible signs that mark us out from the rest of the world, won't there? And I think how we think about and how we use our Christian Sunday, the Lord's Day, I think that will be one of these things. Of course, there's a legalistic Sabbatarianism that can be destructive and miserable. And there has been in parts of Scotland in the past and perhaps even today. But you can take any of God's good commands and pervert them and make a legalistic bondage out of them. It doesn't mean the command isn't right. There is surely, isn't there, good and a holy determination for God's people to receive thankfully the joy of his rest and to honor him for it and to use it for his glory, not just for our selfishness, not to, to exploit it for ourselves, but to use it for his glory and for his people. I think our attitude to Sundays actually does tell us a lot about how enthralled to materialism that we are. You need to ask yourself these questions, don't we? Are you pursuing always those extra shifts which are on Sundays because you get paid more and it'll get you more of the things you want? Are you running your business seven days a week relentlessly to build things up so you can have success and feel you've achieved? Are you studying all these extra hours on a Sunday so you can get better marks and a better degree and get further on in your life or whatever it might be? Are you doing these things at the expense of attention to God and to his people and fellowship with them. Perhaps giving to them through hospitality, serving them through helping in some ministry or whatever it might be. Ask yourself, is, is my treasure, that what I'm chasing, is it telling others as well as me and the Lord where my heart actually is? Perhaps throughout my life, it's telling that I'm not really content with what I have that I want more of these things than actually I want God. Perhaps we should all just go home and read Luke chapter 12 again. It can't do us any harm, can it? Because where there is real obedience of faith and trust in God, his people will be markedly and, and visibly different, distinct from the peoples of the land. Not least in our wholehearted embrace of God's true purpose for sexuality, but also in our joyful embrace of God's liberating patterns of Sabbath that free us from bondage to the material world in every aspect of our life. Meaningful separation that speaks of a consecration of real seriousness. And there will also be, I think, as we see in verses 32 to 39, there will also be people marked by real sacrifice that speaks of the cost of the real stewardship that we have of God's kingdom. Until the Lord comes, God's people in every age have been given the stewardship of his earthly kingdom. Paul says Israel of old was entrusted with the oracles of God. And in just the same way, he says that we in the Christian church are entrusted to be stewards of the mysteries of God, to make his kingdom known. And he says it's required of stewards that they be found faithful to that trust. That is, that we are seeking first the kingdom of God in all things. And it's therefore inevitable that a key sign of real spiritual reformation and renewal and real faith is going to be that that becomes our number one priority, as it was here, verse 32. The service of the house of our God is a priority. Verse 33, the work of the house of our God. Again and again, all through these verses, that's the phrase until you get to verse 39. We will not neglect the house of our God. And if you look at what that meant in terms of financial outlay for these people, it was a very considerable and meaningful sacrifice, wasn't it? Because the principle described here is that which... All through the Bible, we get very, very clearly indeed, and that is that the first 
of our possessions and the best of our possessions is not for ourselves but for the Lord our God. It's a radically different understanding, isn't it, of our material substance from the understanding of the world. And that's because God's people know that everything that we have is a gift of his grace. It all belongs to him. And we're called to be good stewards of the varied graces that he gives us in order that in everything God himself should be glorified. We will not neglect the work of the house of God. That's what their spirit-inspired Bible study had taught them in Nehemiah's day. And it had given them renewed vigor in totally reprioritizing their spending patterns away from themselves and for the work of the kingdom of God. Because they become a truly worshiping people. That is real worship of God, isn't it? Not neglecting, but enabling and doing and paying for the work of God's household. In their day, of course, it was the temple. That was the one place where the living God could be encountered here on earth. But today, of course, it's the work of Christ's church where the living temple of God all around the world is bringing people into encounter with the living God as they come among them and hear his word, his gospel proclaimed. And, of course, all of that work, too, has to be paid for. The New Testament apostles are just as clear, aren't they? Just read 1 Corinthians 16 or 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Perhaps you read it during the offering as examples. And the obligation here in verse 32, this so-called temple tax, when that's spoken of in Exodus chapter 30, it is called two things. On the one hand, it is an offering to God, but on the other hand, it is for the service of the work of the temple. And that's exactly what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 about the funding of his ministry work by those Macedonian Christians as being a fragrant offering to the living God. Well, of course it is, because God doesn't need our money, does he? But the work of his earthly church does need money, and nothing gives such joy to our Father in heaven as giving that enables the gospel of Jesus Christ to be made known so that his name will be praised and responded to and loved and worshipped. So what does that say to us then as a congregation today? Well, surely, if we're a congregation where there's real faith, obedient faith, like here, everyone will be committed to providing for the work of the house of God. Everyone will be saying, we will not neglect the work of the house of our God. Whatever else will suffer, that must not suffer. The gospel and Christ's kingdom must come first. That's what uh, we all promise, isn't it? We'll hear it again tonight when new members say that we promise to give a fitting proportion of our time, our talents, and our money for the church's work in the world. What is a fitting proportion? Well, again, lots of Christians today are very, very unwilling to even use the word tithe, aren't they? Well, it's not a New Testament word. Well, that's true. There's no talk of giving in the New Testament anywhere that remotely conceives that Christian giving, gospel giving, should be anything like so limited as a mere tithe. That's the truth. It's not even limited to a, a mere 10% here, is it? Look, verse 37, there's a set amount. Everybody pays the, the third shekel, whether you're rich or poor alike. And verse 34, there's the wood offerings, very practical. Verse 36, the first part of uh, everything from the ground and the tree. And the firstborn of sons, you didn't actually give your sons, you paid a ransom for them, but you did give every firstborn of your cattle, your sheep, your beasts, everything. And verse 37, not just the raw materials, the dough, the wine, the oil, the first and the best to God. And the plain old tithes that the Levites collected from the land. That's quite a lot of stuff, isn't it? That sounds a lot more like the Macedonian Christians of modest means that Paul writes about. And by the way, he's writing to the Corinthian church to shame them, that wealthy metropolitan congregation. But these poor Macedonians begged, he says, to give, and they gave way beyond their means to the Lord to fund Paul's work of gospel mission. And he says their abundance of joy and poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity. They gave and they gave and they gave again because they loved Christ and they loved his kingdom and they trusted him to provide for their needs. 
They were giving to the needy as Jesus taught and so providing themselves, as Jesus said, with money bags that don't grow old and treasure in heaven that will never fail. That's the pattern, isn't it, for the church of Jesus Christ? Are we doing that? Are we determinedly organizing ourselves personally? Notice how determined and organized all of this is here to make sure that giving happens, to make sure that we don't neglect the ministries that God has given us? Many of us are doing that, I know. But not all of us are doing that. I keep out completely. I have nothing to do with the, uh, the money. I don't know what anybody gives. Uh, I keep right out of all of that. But I did recently ask for some general information. And I was rather ashamed. I was told... And this was something that made my heart joyful, that there are many among us, some even school children, students, others with very little, who give enormously liberally out of the little that they have. But I was also told that there are many professionals, people who must be earning into the thousands of pounds monthly or giving just a few tens of pounds, just like these poor ones. I was told there are many people among us, even church members, who never give anything regularly at all in an organized way. I was told there were people who talk sometimes a lot about wanting to give very generously but never actually get around to ever doing it. I just leave those facts with you to ponder carefully. And I echo Paul, the apostle. He said, each must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to want to give. But Paul also did add, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. We want, don't we, to reap bountifully an eternal harvest of fruit for the kingdom of God. We want to see the kingdom growing more and more in Glasgow and all over the world. How much more worship of God there could be if throughout our city, throughout our land, Christians gave, even with the level of this Old Testament gratitude for the grace that they'd received, how much more should our gratitude be who have received in Christ all things? Who, though he was rich for our sakes, became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich beyond compare. Friends, let's bind ourselves together as God's people today with a meaningful seal to be a people who will not neglect the house of our God. Committed to being meaningfully different from the world around us, in the world but not of it. Seeing marriage, sexual relationships, family life, not for ourselves, not selfishly, but as God's gift for the service of his kingdom. Not competing with church life, but serving church life, having open homes, inviting in, sharing all that we have, whether we're few or many. Seeing material things, all of it, in the same way, for his kingdom, rejoicing in the gifts that God gives us, the gift of his Lord's day, to use it to glorify him and bless others. And determinedly not neglecting the financial needs of gospel ministry all over the world. Giving because we do trust God and we test that trust by actually doing it. Paul says, you will be enriched in every way for all your generosity which will produce thanksgiving to God. Jesus says to us, seek first the kingdom of God. And these things that you worry about so much, they'll be added to you. All that you need. And because he says that, we can say, can't we? Therefore, we will not neglect the house of our God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to be a people committed to you. We want to be a people consecrated, set apart, as you have set us to be truly different, liberated, joyfully, from all that this world chases after and seeks to own, but in the end turns to dust and ashes. 
And we want, Lord, to be a people who in every respect seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. A people who reflect your generous giving to us of grace and abundant grace. Help us, we pray. We're so weak, so easily lured by this world. Help us to help one another. And as tonight we have the joy of welcoming new members to our midst and seeing many baptized, turning their back on a former life and turning towards your kingdom of light. Etch deep into our hearts, Lord, the truth. All these other things are as nothing compared to the surpassing glory of knowing Christ and having our names sealed in his everlasting kingdom. Help us to help one another as we follow you together until that day. For Jesus' sake, amen. We're going to sing to close hymn number 599. The gifts we bring express our love to you who left the heavens above and showed through poverty and pain a God who gives and gives again. We omit the chorus and sing verses 1 to 5 to the familiar tune. Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Lord, may our hearts ever be fixed and fixated on our treasure in heaven, which is in Christ. And to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.